All right, here he is. Yes, we could, we could tell me a little bit about this roller coaster that life has you on. What is going on? Well, you know, my mother has been with me for the last three years, a little bit right before the pandemic. And I'm not used to that. You know, <laughs> I'm not used to, you know, your parents living with you. You know what I mean? That's hard. Um, but she is older and she is sickly. But um, you know how the parents are. You know, you never really grow up. In right. their yes. eyes, yes. you know, you're always their child and it takes a little getting used to because when you're used to running your own home yourself, your way, when someone come in and try to tell you what you should be doing and you've been doing it for the last 20 years by yourself, you're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I got this part, you know, <laughs> so we've been having a little bit of that. I got my daughter here with me. My granddaughter lives with me and uh-huh. my assistant. So all this estrogen in one place under one roof, it can only be one queen of the house. And that is definitely me. But they don't think so. So we we constantly like this. <laughs> and I got to constantly say, this is my damn house. I'm queen B here. You know Aww. what I mean? So and when mom, <laughs> how I've been. And when mom gets older, in a way, she becomes the child because you are the caretaker, even if she's not always recognizing that, which is a whole emotional thing as well. It's very much so because, like I said, she's sickly and she has been that. And she's had everything except COVID, but it's been strenuous, um, nerve wracking, um, shocking, um, a learning curve, mm. and hurtful because I'm watching my mother really deteriorate, you know? Mm. And um, mentally, I'm seeing this physicality had in front of me. And even when I come home from a premiere or an interview or dealing with so many people, my energy is high and I come back, it's like, oh, that's right. That's what's going on. That's right. And so you almost feel a little guilty for being on a natural high or at least coming in laughing when there's so much pain going on with her. Is it hard to so. leave the house and be a star and, you know, to, to summon the energy to radiate and then you go home and you kind of get cut down and then you got to go back out and be the star again. And home is not like nurturing you. It's like bringing you down. You hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly what I have been going through. Um, and no one knows, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's personal. You know what I mean? You don't go out telling your business. But uh, last year, uh, about a year and a half, we did the Iyanla Fix My Life show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we, we went there and obviously, you know, we needed some coaching. We needed some skills to be able to help the, you know, uh, the generational that I feel that, you know, can go down from generation to generation that you want to change. And it was a little um, eye opening and uh, uh, a lot, you know, and so um, I had some epiphanies. I've learned a lot that was going on with my mom and her relationship with my father that as a kid, I didn't know because I was a child. And, you know, mm. when you're younger, you are seen and not heard because I come from the old school. Mm-hmm, you know what mm-hmm, I mean? So it was a mm-hmm. lot of things I did not know. They were I not our friends. When we, when we were growing up, our parents were not our friends, right? Now we're friends At with all. our kids, right? It was different for us. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I've been learning a lot more about her and even their relationship now since she's been in my house than i've ever known but it has made me understand more i have more clarity i have more sympathy Mm. i have more compassion that's Mm. the word i like to use i have Mm. more compassion and understanding for um for her because my mother is old school she's from mississippi Mm. you know and those women you know they stayed with a man they took all kind of stuff they accepted all kind of things that these new millennial women ain't even discussing, you know what I mean? Let alone doing, you know? So there's a part of me that's like, hell no, I wouldn't do all of that. You know what I mean? But it's a certain amount of strength that those women possess that we just don't have at all. Mm. So it's balance that I've been learning. And, and you're right, you know, to go out and get dressed and hair and makeup and go, 
okay, everything's fine. Everything is good. I'm fabulous. Everything's wonderful. And then I go back home and it's like, mm. okay, take this shit off. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, you know, and so it's such a reality check. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you human. Yeah. You got stuff going on with you just like everybody else. And that's why I think it's important for us to share our stories, to let each other know that, hey, I need some help. Hey, I'm going through a difficult time. I'm in a little pain here. I need some encouragement. Can you help me? I think that that, that letting your friends and family know that you're not as strong as what they see all the time. Mm -hmm. Ask me how I'm doing. Ask me how my spirit is doing. Ask me how my heart is doing. Because generally, when you go, hey, how you doing? They don't even never wait no, for no. the answer. Right. But it's not like I'm going to say, oh, girl, I'm going through it right now. I'm not. I'm at an event. I'm not going to do that. But look behind the scenes of my soul. Look behind my eyes and feel me. That's what I feel that we as, as a nation you know, need to do more of. And, of course, now that we got so much mental illness going on and people don't mm. want to be here, people are committing suicide, people are doing crazy and foolish things. Those things are affecting people in a way that they don't know how to deal, mm. you know? So now you're afraid to talk about them or either you don't even have anybody to talk to about things because either you're the breadwinner or people don't believe that you're going through anything or even you just keeping it to yourself or don't even recognize you are depressed. It's real. Mm. It's real to be able to acknowledge that, hey, time out. I need some me time. And that's what 2023 is all about for me. me just, you know, nothing's changed in my house. Everybody's still here. You know, my mom is still here. But it's the way that I deal with it now that's going to help me and help benefit them as well. Because if I'm not the best me, then for me, I can't even help them. That's beautiful. So that's where I'm at for 2023. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, so the house is what it is, but the career looks like it's hot. You made a lot of movies Ooh. in 2021, a lot. You made more movies in 2022. You're on a hot show on All Black. The career is going very well. Yeah. It is. It is. I'm going to be totally honest, though, because um, I always am. You know, this streaming is different okay. than, you know, the regular movies and doing the regular cable network um, productions. and you know, Tyler Perry has made it where, you know, you can film a whole damn series in three weeks. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas before you took months, mm -hmm. which meant you got months worth of checks. Mm -hmm. You got paid differently. Now they want you to conform to this new genre, gen regime of, of filming, and you're doing a whole movie in 23 days. And it's not fair because you look and you say, well, I want to win an award. I want to be able to take my time with this character. I want to be on set and be able to play with the lines a little bit so I can find some other uh, funny points or other rhythm in this scene. But you don't have time because it's two takes and we got to be on to the next mm. because it's just mass production. So the pay is not what it used to be back in the day. So now I'm everywhere, but now I'm looking at my bank account going, wait a minute, I, I took this job because they was like, if you don't take it, we'll, we'll give it to this 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 uh, uh, social media uh, influencer. <laughs> or, or we'll give it to somebody else if you don't want it. So you're forced then to go, um, well, do I take this to stay relevant? I'm damn sure not taking it for the money. I'm taking it for the people that I'm cast with and the body of work that I'd be doing. So then I'm taking one for the team. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of taking one for the team. I've been in this uh, for a minute now, 20 years now, you know? So you're waiting for that particular gig to happen that you're satisfied across the board where the set is great. The people you're working with is wonderful. Your pay is exceptional and you got great hours and your character is wonderful. That type of role. And here's the thing, everything I'm working on, fabulous. I love everybody. I love the production. I love the role. But the money, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for a half of the cost. And that's mm. just being honest and real. Mm. We don't have the money that they have, you know? Mm. And so our stories still are important. Our stories still need to be told. And we still need to work as actors, yeah. you know? So you do compromise and sacrifice just like everything in life, but I'm a little tired of that now. I'm waiting for that either franchise film or something going on that I can go. What, what did Cardi B say? 
Where's my pen? Bitch, I'm signing. You know what I mean? That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about a house divided on all black, which you've been doing for several years. Um, and your character just died. Yeah, you know, and all good things must come to an end, you know. <laughs> but when I started A House Divided, I started out with being a guest star, a cameo. Right. And so because myself and Lawrence Jacobs' uh, chemistry was so good, they kept writing me in more and more and developing the character a little deeper and deeper. And then I came back every season. And it's just been fun and rewarding because we get to be able to um, find so many different colors and different characters that you play because hell let's just be honest that's why i do it i love to play pretend and i get an opportunity to live vicariously through all these different characters and the character that i play on a house divided she's from chicago from where i'm from mm -hmm. and she's a round the way woman and she's had this affair with her sister's husband and mm. how scandalous is that first mm -hmm, of all mm -hmm. but she has a child by him so after the sister dies, I come back to reclaim some of the fortune that I think that I deserve. The interim of all of that, there's love between he and I, because I was that one, that fun, spunky one that he was able to do a lot with, you know? And so now I devised this plan in my mind where I'm going to divide and conquer and get um, greedy. But then because I am his ride or die, we do so much twisted, turn, drama filled stuff that you can't get away with in real life because <laughs> you go to jail. <laughs> that is just fun. Every time I get a script, I go, I'm doing what? I'm doing, okay, what? I, I'm holding a gun. I'm killing somebody. I'm fighting somebody. Let's go, you know? <laughs> so it's been really a, a lot of fun. The grueling hours is what it is because that's the business. But I absolutely have been having a ball. And it's like, it's like a bittersweet, you know? I'm glad that we're going off with a bang you know we yeah. are emmy nominated show yeah. you know the longest running show on all black as well i have some extended family and friends that i've developed relationships with so you know we only as good as our last job so here it is it's mm. come to an end and i am looking for my next well yeah when you as an actor when you get the script and it's like okay this is your week to die are you like damn now i gotta get a new job yeah. And let me tell you, when I read it, it was almost like, oh, that's what y'all doing? Y'all killing me off? That's what's happening? I don't know how I feel now. I don't even know if I can do it, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know? So, and then they said, well, well, no, um, we, we, you know, we can always bring you back. And then it's like, how? How, how, how mm. you going to do that? Let me, let me mm. hear this storyline, you know, <laughs> that mm. kind of thing. But I didn't, I don't think that I even cued into this being the last season. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, um, until I started doing, you know, my press run, and press junkets. And it was like, yeah, this is it. It says finale. Right, <laughs> finale right. Finale means right. So it's end finish. Me, end end me mean? anyway. Yeah. Let yeah, me, so it's like a bittersweet, you know let, what I mean? Let me go back to the beginning for a second, because, look, there's a lot of beautiful women in Hollywood and in television who show up in one project and the men get excited and then we don't really see much of them again. The Players Club, you burned the screen. You were all <laughs> that we were focused on, but it wasn't it, it was the launch of a career and you remain an icon decades later. So how is it that you were able to take that moment and make a career out of it where so many other beautiful women get a shot and then that's the last we see of them? You know, that's funny that you say that because um, that is what I'm so prideful about, you know, and so appreciative for. Players Club was my introduction into the business, period, across the board. I don't even think that I had any fun the first couple of weeks we filmed because I was so focused doing the right thing and just being so on. You know, um, I had some incredible people to look up to. It was Jamie Foxx in there. We had Alex Thomas. We had Ice Cube. We had Michael Clark Duncan. We had Terrence Howard. We had Charlie Murphy. There was so many people in there that I was fans of. So I felt like I got to rise to the occasion automatically on my first come out. You know, Ice Cube told me, he said, 
you're good and you're going to be a star. And I was just so, just to hear those words from someone that I had watched growing up was like, you think so? You know what I mean? Like, I hope so. And I even had an identity crisis after Players Club because I felt like I needed to look like Diamond to be identified, you know, and recognized. Interesting. And so even after Players Club, you know, it, it was, it allowed me to be able to open up a few doors to get more auditions, to yeah. get more opportunity. And then I um, I just polished up my skills as far as even interviewing because everything was the first time for me. I didn't do, I've never done a press junket before. I never talked about the same thing over and over and over again and make it fresh time after time. You know, I didn't know how to curve some of the questions and some of my answers and, and you know, stay forthcoming and stay real and not talk too fast and not do too much. And, you know, it was always, a, ah, uh, uh, you know what I mean, kind of thing. I was like, this is a lot. You know what I mean? Like, I'm working. But it was the best experience in the world. And I don't believe that I knew how to stay relevant at all. I just was still searching to become this star, to become this actress, to become recognized in Hollywood that I was willing to do what was necessary to be seen, whether that was going to this party or showing up at this invited event or being around other celebrities so you can see me too and befriend people that I didn't think that would befriend me. Just being in the right place at the right time was just instrumental because we didn't have social media back then. Right, right. It was like hardcore hit the pavement, knock on doors kind of thing. So that type of drive and tenacity um, allowed me to have a whole different drive, you know what I mean? Uh, other than how we have it now, you know what I mean? It's different now. You so, know? Are, are so, you are you saying the net? Are you saying the networking that you did made the difference to you con- having a lasting career? I do because a lot of people that I ran across. Let me just share this with you. I did videos when I first came to LA. Right, right. Because I knew the directors that were doing videos right. one day wanted to graduate and be a director of movies. Oh. So I knew that. So I definitely had a plan. And so I remember doing Tupac's very last video, Toss It Up, the night before he got murdered in Vegas. I had done so many videos for Suge and Tupac. That was how I was getting paid to pay my bills. And a lot of times you wouldn't even see me in a video because I didn't want to be a video ho. I just wanted to do the work. So I'd hide in the bathroom. I'd run off and go get my daughter and come back. They didn't even miss me because it was so many of us. I just needed the check. I did Tupac's last video, Toss It Up, because it was directed by Lionel Martin, Mm -hmm. which was the director of How to Be a Player. Mm -hmm. So for me, I needed to be very directable and do exactly what he told me and be great. And I was. And I walked up to him at the end of that video and said, hey, I'd love to audition for your movie. And I got that audition. He didn't like me at all. And I didn't get the damn role. But that's okay because I got vouched for. And so by the time Players Club audition came around, one of the producers from some of those videos that I used to do, Carl Craig, rest in peace, was a producer of Players Club. So when I walked in, he stood up and he said, I've worked with this young lady a lot. She's very professional. I'm glad to see you. You know, we're glad you're here. You need anything, do your thing. Mm. And I think that was like more pressure. It was like, what if I don't do good? But I was so green (laughs) that I didn't really know how to audition. It was almost like, just be yourself. You know what I mean? And I did what I did. I came back for a callback and it was so funny. My callback made me say, well, what? Y'all didn't like what I did the first time? You need me to do it different." what I'm here for again. You know what I mean? I just didn't know. You know what I mean? And they were like, no, no, do the same thing you did. But I was reading with a lot of um, Ebony's, which played was my little cousin and a lot of uh, Ronnie's, but I was the only diamond. So by the time I realized that it was like, what's going on, you know, and ice cube said, well, I guess you can figure out by now you got the role. And it was like, well, damn, thanks for telling me. Cause I was just, just like, (laughs) let me know what was going on. And I was just, um, I realized that, you know, what goes up must come down. What goes around comes around. Who you've worked with, you got to make sure that you're making an impression, you know, on that person. So you can be professional and you can be um, up sta- up holding for what and your values and, you know, no casting couch shit, not doing too much, but just being in the pocket. 
and learning how to navigate. You know what I mean? And I've done that very well where when I leave a set, they are at least are able to say she was professional. Mm. She was on time. Mm. She looked good and she performed. That right there is a recipe for we might give you another job. We're going to look for you next time because you weren't a problem. You wasn't a diva. And, 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 and that's what it is. I can act however I'm going to act behind the scenes. But when I get on that set, it's a whole different thing. It's serious because it's my job. So, yes, networking for me back then was everything. But Hollywood is emotionally difficult and auditioning and not getting roles is emotionally difficult. And you feel a little torn down by Hollywood sometimes. We get more no's than we get yeses. Right. And then you try to figure out what can you do better or why didn't you get chosen for this? But once you realize that they have an idea of whom they're looking for and what they're looking for, sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Sometimes the politics of what we do gets in the way, meaning if they have a brown skin, dark skin lead, they may want a light skin opposite. If he's short and you're tall, you're not getting that role because now they need you to be the same height. If the kids have been chosen and cast before you and they're brown skinned kids, you may not fit the bill. My accent may not work because this young lady is from New York instead of Chicago or the South. And if I don't do accents, then I'm out of that job totally. Or you just may not be good for the damn role, period. Mm. <laughs> That's just what it is. It may be someone else that has come through with more experience, more exposure that will help them push the show that they're they're casting for. Mm. So when you realize that, you can say, OK, it wasn't about me. When you learn to walk away from that audition because you've done it, you've left it. If it was supposed to be yours, they'll call you until then. Keep it moving. I learned that about maybe uh, a couple of months into my audition process. Mm. It's still hurtful because you're looking like, man, when's my next job going to come? I need something. But you keep on the grind because you know that that's what it's about. I think you're gorgeous. I think if I mention your name to most men, especially the brothers, they would immediately think she's gorgeous. I wonder if you look in the mirror and see I'm beautiful, I'm sexy, or you need... You, you need something to get there. I know a lot of women sometimes have a hard time seeing it the way we see it. I, I don't see it the way that everybody see it. Um, I don't I th like when they say sexy, it was almost like, what, what exactly is that? You mm. know, what makes me sexy? And I would try to find women that I thought was sexy, but I, I, I didn't see that. I like Diane Carroll mm. back in the day. I didn't see sexy. And no. I think maybe because I was younger, but I didn't see sexy. I saw boss. Yes. I saw bitch. Yeah. I mean, I saw diva. Yeah. I saw that, but I didn't see sexy. And even in Eartha Kitt, when I saw Eartha Kitt and she was like, <sighs> I didn't see sexy. I just saw alluring and that she was on a prowl. You know what I mean? I saw sexy for the first time in Angelina Jolie. Mm. It was like, what is it about this bitch that is making everybody just want to be a fly on the wall when she's in the bedroom? Because she got it. Is it in her lips? Is it in her pouting? Is it in her eyes? Is it in? Because let's think about it. She don't have no body. <laughs> Not the body that we used to. For right, 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 right. You right. know what I mean? You don't have that. You know, and it was like, but it was just the way. It, I don't know. It was just her confidence or whatever. And so I would ask men. What do you find sexy about me? What is that? And they would come up with all this stuff that I guess that didn't resonate with me. It was like, it's just the way that you walk. It's the way that you eat. It's the way that you talk. Well, I'm from South Side of Chicago and I'm animated. I'm, I'm this, you know what I mean? And I'm like, that's sexy. <laughs> I never thought that that would be sexy because you can turn the camera on and anybody can be like, I can do all of that. And when the camera go off, then it's like cut. And it's like, okay, cool. Is that sexy? What is that? I have never found out what that is for me. But I think maybe perhaps that that's good because 
if I did know what it was, maybe perhaps I would play it up and I don't need to, you know what I mean? Right. So if they think I'm sexy, great. I, I Do I think I'm pretty, a pretty woman? Yes. Yes, I, I absolutely do. I know that I, I can turn some heads or two. You know what I mean? I know I have that. I take great pictures. I know I'm a ham. Lights, camera, action. Where you at? Here I am. Cheese, chick, chick, chick. I got all of that. But sexy and deeming me to be a sex symbol, all I can say for that is thank you. <laughs> Wait, no. So let's keep it real because I know you like to tell the truth. You've been to jail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you beat people up? Well, yeah. <laughs> what happened? Was trying to beat me up. Tell me what happened. <laughs> um, what really happened is I used to get bullied when I was in school, and uh, we almost told her name because her name is always <laughs> on the tip of my tongue. I remember that bully. Let me tell you, but she was going to get me. And you know, when you're a kid in school and you hear the whispers of, you know, she want to beat you up, she want to fight you. You like, why? You know what I mean? It's it's even more scary because you don't really know when it's going to happen right, or right, if anybody's right. going to help you or even stop it. You know what I mean? Right. And I was one of those kids that was like, whatever I had, I would share with you. And if I didn't have enough, I'd bring you some the next day. So I was so accommodating and nice. And I just couldn't understand why she didn't like me, you know? And sure enough, one morning uh, at school, that morning dude was on the grass. She got ready to tackle me. And honey, she fell. On that morning grass. And when I tell you when she fell, that's when I got her. And, you know, a scared person can get you just by default. You know what I mean? Right, right, and right. I, I got her. You know what I mean? And the whole school, it went through the whole school that she did not beat me up. Because when you end up beating up the bully in the school, now you become the one that's like, wait, she got her. You know what I mean? And it happened again to me in high school. You know, this young lady felt that I was befriending her boyfriend and she was older than me. I was a freshman. She was a senior and her boyfriend's um, sister was my, my best friend. So I would be over there all the time. I don't know. I guess she felt like he was looking at me and maybe perhaps I was looking at him as an older guy, but I wasn't a fast girl or anything. You know what I mean? So I wasn't trying to get with him, but she thought so. And she came to my locker, smacked me and told me to stay away from her man. And when I tell you, you'd have thought nothing happened because it was just like, shock, okay, keep going. You know, and it was like, act like that didn't happen. And my cousin was a senior and she was uh, a force to be reckoned with. And she came up to me and she said that her name was Tina. I'll, I'll let you know that. Okay. She said, did Tina smack you? I said, yeah, she did. She said, what did you do? I said, nothing. She said, no, come on. And I was thinking, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want no trouble, you know. <laughs> and she took me to her and she said, you put your hands on her. She said, if you ever put your hands on her, I'm going to have her whoop your ass and then I'm going to whoop your ass. And I was like, yeah, that part. <laughs> like, at least if you're going to be with me, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to go down. So, yeah, you know what I mean? And then I thought then it was like, am I too nice? Am I giving off something that they feel like they can take advantage of me? What is this? Because I don't want this anymore. I don't want this to happen. And I became like, you know, you got to stand up for yourself, you know? And then I, st I started standing up for all the, all the bullies, you know, for all the people that got, got bullied. bullied. Yeah. It was almost like, you know what? Now do that to me. You know what I mean? And so I had that growing up and then my father was murdered mm. when I, um, was in my 20s. Mm. Totally devastated me and totally turned my life upside down. So then I became a bit of a rebel. And um, I just went on the wrong course. All my friends that was doing anything bad, I think I was attracted to. It was like, you writing checks? I want to write checks too. Mm. You you got fake, fake ID? I want fake ID too. You know, And it was just the peer pressure of just wanting to be in, wanting to be accepted, really. And I remember because my father was a, a, a big businessman, prominent businessman in Chicago. So everybody, you know, knew us. And when he passed, um, I remember there was a couple of young ladies that was like, you know, don't say that. You know, her father just passed. And then the girl was like, you know, um, F her father. And it was like, ah. mm -mm. she said, what? Mm -mm. And I ain't gonna never forget. I had on um, back in the day, the nails would be real long and curved. Mm. I, 
She waited until I did all 10. You just ate off your nails. And as soon as I bit off that last nail, I commenced to whooping that ass <laughs> for every girl that ever tried to do anything to me. I took it all out on her. And I already had power because of who my father was. So I already carried guns. You know, I already, you know, because we owned hotels and motels. My father owned 12. So, you know, I was carrying a gun only because we would take the money to the bank. And some of the hotels were in some rough areas. And so it was for protection. But I was told it for even if you mess with me, I get you. At least I pistol whoop you or something. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. So I kind of grew up with women testing me and I became the girl that don't let the light skin fool you. Mm. And I'm that even now I don't act with that much, you know, you know, bulliness or anything in me like I used to, but you damn sure ain't going to fuck with me. That's for sure. Wait, did you ever have to use the gun? I have before. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> This man tried to snatch my chains. Remember that era back in the day when you used to wear like 15 chains all the way down? And he snatched my chains and ran. And it was like, uh-uh, you're not getting away with mine. So it was like, I was almost like a police woman. Wait a minute. And I got him in the leg. Then he, he fell down and I went to go get my chains. Like, give me my chains. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I feel, I feel the tough girl energy in you. Like I hear these stories. I'm like, it's not surprising as gorgeous and sexy. as She is. I feel like she's not to be tested. And if you push her, she will punch you. She will tell you off. She will shoot. Like I, I feel that. Right. And I don't know where that came from because I'm telling you, I have never been a bully, but I'm absolutely for the underdog. Right. Like I am. It's like, I do not like people to just be, you know, mean to people for no reason and take advantage of people. I don't like that. I do not like that. And I, I have, I've been that way across the board. I don't mess with nobody, but I don't want you messing with me either. I really believe that there's a way that you can come and talk and handle anything. But if you come to me the wrong way with a lot of body language and pointing the finger and all of this, I, I'm not the one. You ain't got to talk to me like that. You ain't got to disrespect me. None of that. I don't take well to that at all. And the older I get, of course, the more mature I am. I handle things differently because now I can walk away. But if you, in my personal space, I'll just say, I ain't running away. Uh, right. I'll say that part. Right, right, right. right. I love you. I love <laughs> you. You're always in white. Why? Um, I'm not a virgin, but I might be an angel. <laughs> no. So I think that when my father passed, my mom had made such a big deal out of us going to get these black outfits. And over the years, I've tried to think, why white? Why for so long? What is really going on with this white? Because it, I never did it to set myself aside as a trend or anything. Mm. I don't know what really drove and attracted me to just wear white. Because trust me, it's hard. Because white comes in so many different shades mm -hmm. till you put it up and it's like, dang, that don't go together. I tried to make it easy for me so I don't have to pick colors and see what go together. Now it's even harder. But honestly, nobody does white the way that I do. And I never look the same. Never. And so I, I would say that it's not a religious thing, but what I've tried to identify with is like maybe because black to me. It's so dark. Yeah. It's so like cover. I, I I I can't do black, you know. So when I think about it, it's like, is it attached to my father's death and funeral and that mm. damn suit that I had to wear? And it made me go, I'm going all the way left. I'm wearing white. Mm. You know, what is it? I don't have a ta-da answer. I just feel good in it. It makes me feel crisp and clean. I never get dirty. I'm never, you know, oh, don't put your kid on me. Oh, I can't go, you know, camping in my white or I, it's never that. I, I think one time I got dirty and it was a can of soda I had and I popped the can and it said, Psh, and it went all over me. 
And literally, I said nothing. I put the can down, went in the room, took them clothes off, and threw everything away. You know what I'm saying? And that was what it is. But I even try to come out of white because I'll buy something that I like that's bad as hell and make me go, I'm buying this because I'm going to wear this. And my friends go, you ain't wearing it. Yes, I am because I'm spending my money on this, so I'm going to wear it. It's still in my closet years later. So I don't even know when I'm going to come out of white. I have tried to pop out of white every now and then for like Susan G. Coleman, you know, breast cancer sure. month or whatever. I'll try to wear light pink or something. And I'll even try to go into cream a little bit because that's close to white. Mm. You know what I mean? I try mm. to do a little silver, you know what I mean? Because that's close to white. Mm. But that's about it. Mm. I do pops of color. My accessories and jewelry, belts, shirt, boots, and all of that are color. But what touches my body is white. You you, you keep coming back to your dad. And I, I feel that because my father passed uh, a, f- a few years ago. And, and, and it's, it sticks in you. It doesn't leave your heart. It, it, I'm speaking to him constantly. I'm trying to live up to what he would want and what he lived. And do you find yourself... It seems like you constantly sort of are, he's a very present part of your life, even though he hasn't been here for a while. That's, um, that's kind of special. You picked that up that quick. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he, uh, he was all of that. I was a daddy's girl. Sorry. Uh -uh. Just when you think that you have grown past something, you can really talk about it. You never never get over it. I'm not over it. I... Uh, I am really like in my adult life, my mother has shared with me more and more that I'm just like my father. My father was a businessman. I never saw him wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Mm. Never. And I am very much so that I pop up like toast and it's like, I'm ready to conquer the day. I definitely have that. But believe it or not, that has come between me and my mother. Because I was so close to him that perhaps she felt like she and I, she she felt like that he and I were closer Mm -hmm. than them. Mm. So that's been some of me and my mother's bumping heads. And, um, you know, I could have handled things differently as a kid. But, you know, when you're a kid, you go to and gravitate to the parent that lets you have your way. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, so if mm-hmm. I wanted to go to a party and you say no all the time, I'm going to go to him, mm-hmm. you know, and she felt that she felt the control that I had over him. But I was a kid. And when you're a kid. How in the hell you go from making me laugh to making me cry? <laughs> I, that was not my intention. On? That was not my intention. That was not my intention. Goodness. Oh, man. You know, so, sometimes um, in the distance, I see him. If there uh, uh, was a man who's a certain color or a certain shape or wearing a, the hat that he, and my eyes are like, oh, there he is. And my conscious mind is like, you know, that's not him. But my, I'm like, but you see what these eyes are seeing. That is him. And then you blink and it's like, oh, no, no, that's, you know, that's obviously not him. But like, he's so present still. It's been years. And you still, he's still very much in you. And you know what's so funny? My mom would tell me, I had a dream. Your daddy came to me last night. Mm. Or I was talking to your father and I used to get so mad because I really felt like, what do you mean he came to you? Why he ain't never came to me? Because mm. he and I was close. What's going on? And I was always afraid to say that out loud. But that is always what I felt. I saw him one time when I had my daughter. And they raised me up to push. And I saw him in the corner. But when they put me back down to come back up, he was gone. 
But I guess I was in so much, you know, pain. It was just like pushing the baby out. But it was almost like, come back. Mm. And I have never seen him since. Mm. And doggone it, I've been wanting to talk to him. I've been wanting to get answers on things. Because I do feel like a lot of times, if I, being in Hollywood and he was here, it'd be different. Mm. He would have made me take my first amount of money and said, no, no, you're going to invest that over here or we're going to buy this because that's who he was, you know, and me being a late bloomer and not knowing business like he knew business, I I would have learned so much more and know more than I know now, but it wasn't designed that way. And so I've been navigating through life being, trying to make it up, meaning I was spoiled. I heard through my family that, you know, she's she not going to really amount to much. Mm. She's she not going to do much because she's so spoiled. And it was like, wow. Are they right? Because what do you want to do? Because now that my father's deceased, I didn't want to do anything. It was mm. like, I didn't even want to be a part of the businesses because my mother took over everything. And she wanted me to help like I used to. But what she didn't realize is that she was taking me into something that I felt like I would never get back again. And that was my father. So it hurt mm, me. Wow. I didn't know how to articulate that. I didn't know how to, to say that. I don't even think I knew that that what it was back then. But as I grew up and we kept getting further and further apart, it was like, what is going on? You know what I mean? Because she's my only parent left. My father's not here. Surely she and I are supposed to be like this. Mm. When I left Chicago to come to L.A., I said, I'm going to, you know, become an actress. You ain't going nowhere. See, people don't respect our business because when you're going to be a writer or an entertainer or an actress, they like, you better get a real job. Right. They don't respect it until you make it. Right. Oh, but when you make it, it's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> my daughter is. And my cousin did. And my girlfriend is. It's that. What happened when I got ready to? So when I came out here, no was not an option. No, I didn't want to hear that. I had to. And I was a single parent. But when I tell you Mm. the drive that Chicago and my father and mother upbringing of me played such a role, I was so no, no nonsense because I had to make it. I had done all this whole other shit in my life that made me go, finally, girl, what are you doing? Your father's probably rolling over in his grave. You ain't got to do none of this. You just trying to be in. Find your own end. This thing, you ain't about this life. Writing checks and 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 battery and 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 assault and and all this social. What? Girl, stop it. Get a life. And when I came to L.A., it gave me a second chance to become whomever that I wanted everyone to believe that I was. And I never has been I've never been a fake person. So laced in that becoming an actress, I've always been Chicago. And I think that's what people feel inside of me. You really affirmed it. You 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 talked to yourself. You told yourself this is not the right path. I am changing and making that sort of 180 degree change is hard in life. But you motivated that in yourself. I did. And I, you know, looked at my daughter, which she saved my life. Wow. Because if I hadn't had her, I had her, I had her 10 months after my father passed. Mm. And so it made me have to get my life together. I had someone that was depending on me and God knew that I needed someone to love me unconditionally. Someone that I had to take care of that needed me. I needed to have that. And I was. I rise to the occasion. I was the best mom and mm. I was the carpool mom and I was going on all the dates and I was going to help with homework. I was going to learn how to cook. I was going to be there for you. We were going to go to bed on time. I was going to be ultimate mom because my mother really was that. So I think when I came to Hollywood and started doing interviews and people saw the business person in me, they took and gravitated to the story that my father and I had. And never talked about my mom because that wasn't entertaining for a girl to be 
like the mom because we're supposed to be because we're girls. You know, so if you know how to cook and clean, you're supposed to. So that wasn't newsworthy. And she didn't feel appreciated. She felt like I always pushed my father's story. But it really wasn't that. But people saw it in me just like you just did. Just like you just said, hey, you keep talking about your dad. And I didn't even realize that I was doing that. But I always reference back to because it's in me. It is in me. And I know who I am now. And I know where I got it from. So, yes, it shines through now. And is it still hard for me? Yes, it is. Because I lost my number one fan. Mm. He was the one that came to all my fashion shows. All of my photo shoots. He said I can do it because I felt that energy from him because he told me. After that, it was like, who's going to tell me that I'm going to make it? Mm. Who? Not after I do it and you say, oh, that's good. Not after the fact. But while I'm doing it, who is uplifting me? Who is supporting me? Who is pushing me? There was no one. Mm. So I had to become that. And I never had a job. I worked for my family. So my first job, it's Hollywood. So me to show up and be on time and be professional and be, that's all new to me. I didn't have to do shit. But now I come to a, a place where every pretty girl is trying to become an actress. My story was I didn't have to wait tables. But I, mm. I still have my own personal struggle. And my struggle is mine and my struggle is real. So you can't discredit or devalue me because I didn't do it like the way you did. But I had my own things. There's a lot of days that my daughter didn't even go to school because I was on the set and she was on the set with me and we was just up late. There's a lot of times that she didn't get a chance to do her homework because we didn't have time. A lot of times that she uh, didn't go to school because I didn't have a babysitter. So it was like, okay, well, we're going to skip today. There was a lot of things that I had to do that I couldn't even share with my mother because she wasn't having it. My mother's an old school Mississippi woman. You ain't, you ain't bearing away from the path. So I had to keep all this inside until I made it. And when I made it, it was like, see, look, this is what I bought. This is where I am. This is how I'm living. See, oh, look, now I got this movie. Now I got this. See, surely I'm making something of myself now. And I didn't even enjoy the process until it was like, I don't have to prove this to nobody. Mm. I am self-made. I am doing it. Breathe. Mm. Enjoy. You know, and I happened to fall into something that I had no idea that I would love as much as I do. And I am so glad because yet again, I needed it. I needed it. And then I, I get pleasure out of knowing that I've taken a little bit of who my mother is, who my, and a lot more of who my father was to make up who I am. I'm proud of who I am. I like me. Mm. I like me. I like what I've accomplished. Do I want more? Do I want to be bigger, better, and more? Uh, yeah, but I don't want to be Halle Berry, Britney Spears famous because I don't want to go through all of that. I don't want paparazzi and people outside my house and I can't go nowhere and nothing is private. I don't want that. I'm okay where I'm at. Do I want more movies or bigger movies? Yes. I'm in a different place than I was 10 years ago, even five years ago. There's a different drive there. There's a different maturity there, you know, that has made me become and, and and accept all the things that I've done where I've been to make up this woman that you are seeing right now. I have a story and my story is not the only story. People out there identify with who I am. And that's what makes my fan base so real and keeps me so relevant. When we talked about that, you know, how do I stay in network and be able to stay relevant? I am one of the fewer actresses that have a small body of work, but I'm a household name. Mm -hmm. You do know who I am. Mm -hmm. From one movie, Players Club, to now, I work. And I, when I feel proud because even when I go to a party now, the millennials, they go, you a bad bitch. We love you. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, my God. Thank you. I grew up watching you. And I'm like, wow. Okay. There's respect there. There's a respect there of realness and genuineness that they feel that they embrace me and I hang out and I got friends that are young millennial girls that I got to remind them, hey, I am 55. I am leaving this club right now. Y'all can stay all night. <laughs> I'm not. I see you. <laughs> Deuces. <laughs> you know what I mean? But to be able to hang with them and they want me to hang with them. 
Oh my God. They, they I'm dropping it like a hot, they hot, like when they twerking. And they like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and we having a ball. <laughs> Lisa Ray, you are amazing and awesome and a spiritual force. And I am so grateful to have had another moment to sit and talk with you and I hope we can do it again because you are awesome. You know, you have always been the same. Every time we see each other, you've always been nice. You've never changed at all. And those are the people that you remember while you're climbing up because you don't know when the next time we're going to see each other or even if I'm going to need your help or even if we work on something together. You're reporting and you're, you're allowing me to use your platform to get the words and the feelings and the emotions out on paper and to people's ears. I appreciate you. Everything we do, we are connected to everybody. I'm connected to you, if nothing but this last 45 minutes. But people don't know that we've done this before. That there's a relationship there that we see each other and it's like, hey, yeah. there's a genuine life there. And yeah. when you genuinely like somebody, I know my interview is not going to be the kind of interview that I got to go. Wait, what? He put what up? He did a bait and click for what? And say, well, I ain't say that. It's not going to be that. No, no. There's a mutual trust and understanding there. And, and you are an upstanding person. And when you are that kind of person, that shines. That comes through. So what I'm really saying is thank you. No, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you. I'm 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 going to carry that for the rest of the day. That means a yeah. lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>